campus. So I am going to uh, introduce our first speaker. Um, and let me pull up his information. Uh, William Buck is the author and primary photographer of the National Trails Guide, America's Hidden Wonders. Over the course of a decade, he visited all 30 of the country's national, scenic, and historic trails, completing 20,000 miles of journeys. He's visited all 50 states on road trips, rail adventures, and hiking treks, and he's also explored extensively across the Cascadia region. His work has been published in The Guardian, New York Times Syndicate, and newspapers across the West. Uh, William, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now and uh, get this PowerPoint going. All right, everybody. It's good to be here. This is a whole new thing. We're uh, we're living in a Zoom world now, so that's the kind of thing that, that we have to do nowadays. And uh, I hope that you enjoy it. So we're gonna go from the very top and my title is Celebrating Oregon's National Trails. Okay, so I wrote a book called National Trails Guide, America's Hidden Wonders. And uh, here's a map I'm gonna show you briefly because we have a little quiz. Four of these trails are in Oregon, okay? We're gonna go back to the map pretty soon, but I wanted to share with you for now uh, the opportunity to win a free audio book. We wanted to give something away. So if you can name all four national trails in the state of Oregon, type your answers into the chat box that uh, she was just talking about. The first three correct responses will win a free audio book. So good luck, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here. Uh, here's my book. Audiobook is on the left, and my uh, ebook slash print is on the right. Um, it took me a lot of time to write this book. I worked on it for uh, about eight years and uh, traveled to all 50 states, visited all 30 of the national trails, and uh, had a lot of fun, a lot of great road trip partners. A lot of the good stuff is right here in our beautiful state of Oregon, so I'm happy to report that. And uh, got about 100 photos in the book and custom maps, and um, you're going to learn more about all this shortly. So I had to do a lot of traveling, of course, because I went all, all over the country. This map you see behind me is uh, all of those trails I visited at least two segments of um, on foot and some by water. This was probably one of the most exciting places, was the top of Mount Katahdin in the beautiful state of Maine at the very end of the Appalachian Trail, or the beginning, depending on how you look at it. But this is the uh, sister trail of our beloved Pacific Crest Trail here in, uh, in, on the West Coast. But for those of you on the East Coast, uh, you know how beautiful Maine is. And if you ever get a chance, check out the Appalachian. This is our jewel here, our uh, crown jewel of the National Scenic Trails, Pacific Crest. I'm sure everybody uh, on this call knows about the PCT. Um, this is in Mount Hood, actually. So one of the greatest places that I went to on the PCT was right here, where the Barlow Road, which is part of the Oregon Trail, intersects with the Pacific Crest Trail. So it was winter time. As you can see, there's some snow on the trail. and. Uh, Yes, it gets pretty exciting out there. Uh, the weather can be pretty intense. We got mosquitoes up there right now, I'm sure, in that very spot. Uh, I wanted to just kind of bring it full circle for people in the Ashland area because I'm, I know that everyone here has heard about Wild. Uh, it was a national bestseller. It was the Oprah Book Club by Cheryl Strait. And then it was made into a movie with Reese Witherspoon. And of course, part of that film was shot right here in the lovely town of Ashland. So some of you guys might remember that. But I just wanted to kind of bring up another example of the National Trails getting more uh, Hollywood attention and uh, kind of public awareness that they don't typically get. So here is the second National Trail I'm gonna mention. So I'm giving you guys hints. I'm not sure, I haven't been looking at the chat box, so I don't know. Some of you might have already won, all three, but you're getting, you're getting hints. 
So Jeff is going to talk a lot more about this shortly, but the California Trail, uh, there's a component of that trail called the Applegate. And um, I'll show you more of that a little bit later, a little close up. But it was basically an alternate route of the California Trail or the Oregon Trail, depending on you know how you look at, at all that. This is in Baker City. And if those, those of you who live uh, in the area, if you can ever get out there and see the, uh, the interpretive center in Baker City, it's beautiful. And that's where this uh, stagecoach was, uh, was photographed. And you can actually see the Oregon Trail in the background if you look carefully. The actual route is, is a dusty little trail in the background there. The California and Oregon Trails go through what I call America's first interstate. So back in the 1840s, a lot of people were migrating, as you guys know, um, not just on these two trails, but also the Mormon Trail. And then this particular spot, which is Scotts Bluff in Nebraska, was also part of the Pony Express Trail. So all four of those trails are national trails, and they go through some beautiful country, as you can tell. I got to this spot right about sunset and was able to get a, one of the most iconic parts of the whole route in this just beautiful light. So I love photography. Uh, here's a quick view of the Applegate Spur, or you know, the, the alternate route, I should better say. And if you look at the Ashland uh, mark, you'll see a red trail going all the way through. Uh, it goes along Highway 66 and Green Springs area, and then down into Ashland, and then up to the Willamette Valley. So that's a better close-up view of how intricate these trails could be. Um, the Oregon Trail and the California Trail veer off, as you can see. The Oregon Trail is fun to visit. And I took this picture. I was only going about seven miles an hour, so don't worry. No animals were hurt. But uh, you see some amazing things uh, along the route. And this is eastern Oregon, just kind of out in the boonies. And uh, I just I love this picture. I just had to share it. Here's another example of the Oregon Trail, and I think anybody under the age of 50 has probably played this at their, uh, was it fifth grade or sixth grade? Um, this was an actual game that people uh, played as part of a, a school project that helped teach people about what life was like on the Oregon Trail. So I just wanted to kind of help bring it full circle and, and show you a little bit more of the the popular culture and how the Oregon Trail has kind of become part of the American uh, story, really. So the final of the four, so now the truth is out, Lewis and Clark Trail, and uh, it ends over by Astoria, Oregon, as uh, I think a lot of you might know, and Fort Clatsop, where the Lewis and Clark Corps uh, of Discovery wintered, pretty rough winter. But I wanted to point out with this photo, my friend Bart Smith took this shot, another great uh, photographer that I, you guys would love. If you get a chance to Google his name, Bart Smith. But he, uh, he took a canoe all the way down the Missouri River uh, as part of the Lewis and Clark Trail. And uh, a lot of the Lewis and Clark is water. So I, about 80% at least is on rivers. So national trails are not just trails. They're also water trails. So. Uh, this is one of my favorite spots right here on the, all of the whole network uh, near the upper Missouri breaks um, in, in Montana. And there is the map. So I just wanted to give you guys a, a, a second glimpse at the, the full picture. And uh, I just think it's a beautiful image because it shows you how deep America's stories can go. Um, you see something like the Trail of Tears down here. Uh, that's a very intense trail that every American should know about, immortalized in the national trail system. So here are the answers, my friends. So I haven't been able to look. I've been too busy, but I'm sure somebody won the audiobooks. Congratulations. It's, uh, there's a lot going on in this wonderful state of Oregon, and uh, we're proud to have four national trails. The California Trail and the Oregon Trail kind of share the Applegate you know, rights, I guess you'd say bragging rights, but uh, California Trail officially gets the Applegate as part of its, its uh, National Park Service designated route. Okay, can we get that poll, Teresa? 
I'm just curious if uh, how many people have actually been to Oregon's trails. Uh, so just take a quick look at this and, and mark the boxes of any of those that you've, uh, that you've been to. Pacific Crest Trail, Oregon Trail, Lewis and Clark Trail, Applegate slash California Trail. That's uh, right here in, in Ashland. So that might be a, an easy one for some of you guys. You've, you've definitely been to that one. So um, I'm just gonna show you another list and there are 11 scenic trails and then there are 19 historic trails. So that's where it gets a little, a little confusing, but I'm gonna bounce back and forth a couple times just so you guys can see. There's 19 historic trails and 11 scenic trails and they have different designations based on um, their value. Uh, scenic trails tend to be more something you can visit on foot on a trail. Uh, they're a lot of times they're recreationally based, whereas the historic trails kind of sum up the history of, of a route that was important in American history. So uh, there you go. That's very interesting, my friends. 86% of you guys have been to the Pacific Crest Trail. That's pretty cool. A lot of hikers out there. Um, take a look at those results if you can see them. Oregon Trail, Lewis and Clark, Applegate. This might continue to be updated, but uh, anyway, here's how you can get involved. Get out there, get out there on the trail, explore, learn about this incredible country of ours, and uh, invite your friends. You gotta, of course, this crazy time we live in, you gotta follow the current trail guidelines, and I'd like to just share with you briefly, I just went to the Pacific Crest Trail Association's website, and they are saying that day trips are fine now on the PCT, but they prefer it to be where you live. So we're lucky enough here where you can take a one hour drive at the most and, and hike a section of the Pacific Crest. So they're now saying that that's safe. They don't want people doing through hikes, which is going all the way from Mexico to Canada, of course, but uh, day trips are fine if you, follow the guidelines and social distancing and all that good stuff. So share your love on social media about the national trails, volunteer, share your skills. If you have something that you can share with a, an organization, please do so. We need stewards. Um, it's a big deal actually. Public lands need our help as always and get involved, become a steward and adopt a trail, so to speak. Thank you to SOLC, Teresa and Tara and uh, hey, Let's get this meme going, you guys. What do you say? We need help getting the word out on the national trails. Thank you. Uh, there is my contact information. If you guys uh, want a signed copy of the book, I can make sure I get that to you. It's available on Amazon as well, and audiobook, ebook. And I wish we could have done this live, everybody. So uh, thank you very much to everybody. And uh, can't wait to listen to the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much. What a fabulous overview of these incredible trails that are right here in our backyard. And thank you all for your active participation in the chat and in the poll. It's always fun to have something to do during a webinar. Um, so we are very glad you jumped in there. Uh, now our next speaker is Jeff Willand. There he is. And for more than 30 years, Jeff was an archeologist and historian for the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. Um, he's been an adjunct faculty member at Southern Oregon University for 20 years. Uh, he enjoys learning and writing about Northwest history and he's the author of numerous articles and several books on the topic. He's also an active board member of several statewide and community organizations. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, I hope I'm, okay. Uh, so hello everybody. Uh, and Zoom I think is maybe one of those good things that's come out of COVID. Uh, it's new and it's pretty cool. Uh, so let me get the PowerPoint up and running. I'm assuming that is on and I'll, Start the slideshow. It is, Jeff. Good job. Okay. From beginning, that's a good place to start. So uh, just a little bit uh, 
on my mother's mother's side, I had direct ancestors way back who were became Mormon converts, and they came over on the Mormon Trail in 1848 all the way to Utah from back east. And they were, in a way, kind of inhaling the dust left by Brigham Young's wagon train on the Mormon Trail two years before, 1846, the very same year that the Applegate Trail was first blazed and used. And the Applegate Trail, pretty tough stretch of road, and it was uh, kind of an alternate route for both the Oregon Trail and the California Trail. Uh, I had never heard of the Applegate Trail, however, when I first moved here back in uh, 1969. It's just not all that well known to the general public outside of our area. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take kind of a newspaper reporter's approach, uh, basic questions to try and answer as I go through this. So it was originally called the Southern, by Oregonians, it was originally called the Southern Immigrant Road. And uh, because of the uh, names of the locators, the, the settlers from the Willamette Valley, who in 1846 traveled south and then east, kind of blazing the trail to meet with uh, the original Oregon Trail off in southeastern Idaho, uh, it became known as the Applegate Trail or and or the Scott's Trail, Levi Scott's Trail. Over the years, it's simply become shortened to Applegate Trail. And for uh, where it followed, uh, this is the Applegate Trail coming along here. If you went to California on the Applegate Applegate Trail, you'd head on down this way. But I'm focusing on it as a way to get to Oregon. Uh, and it continued on through the Rogue Valley, up north through Canyon Creek, and Umpqua drainage into the Willamette Valley, which at that point was, that's what everybody thought was Oregon in their mind, was that emerald green uh, fertile valley of the Willamette. <clears throat> going to talk about the main or original Oregon Trail for a little bit. Located well to the north of Southern Oregon, was developed from routes that were blazed by British and American fur trappers. And I have the British in quotes because most of their employees of the Hudson's Bay Company, a British company, were uh, French Canadian trappers. <clears throat> and the first wagon trains of American immigrants over the original Oregon Trail uh, came across in 1841. In 1843, you had the first really big migration across the Oregon Trail. Uh, it was known as the Great Migration in Oregon history for many, many years. It was a big deal back then to the early settlers to be able to say, you came with the Great Migration. So the original Oregon Trail route starting back along uh, the west side of the Missouri River at various places, including uh, St. Joseph, Missouri and Westport, present day Kansas, and went on up the North Platte River and eventually to the Continental Divide at South Pass and made its way to the Snake River Plain in Southern Idaho, over the Blue Mountains and down the Columbia River uh, to the Willamette Valley. And along the way, uh, much of the route through western uh, Nebraska and easternmost uh, Wyoming was along the Platte River in French. That means flat, very flat country. And the river was described as being a mile wide and an inch deep. You probably heard that phrase. And its mud choked water <clears throat> was described as too thick to drink and too thin to plow. This is in present day Nebraska here. And over here is uh, Chimney Rock, that very, one of the very first landmarks that let the travelers know, whoa, we're coming into a very different looking country now to see something like that, getting closer and closer to you as they keep heading west. And Scott's Bluff, and then on into what's now Wyoming to an American fur traders post, Fort Laramie. It was not an army post at this time. By 4th of July, you wanted to be at Independence Rock, this big granite monolith out in the middle of nowhere, basically, where they would stop, uh, uh, tank up on water from the Sweetwater River, 
which was a tributary of the, the North Platte, scribe their names on the rock, and then continue on their way through more and more sagebrush to the Continental Divide at South Pass. Well, you hear the word South Pass and you think, oh, it's a mountain pass, that's gonna be pretty rugged. It is not, you hardly even know. You're crossing the Continental Divide from waters that flow to the Gulf of Mexico to waters that flow to the Pacific. It's a very broad, gentle pass, and that's what made it so important uh, for wagon travel. <clears throat> and on into, eventually, to southern uh, Idaho, the Snake River Plain, that big volcanic table land, and you're paralleling along uh, the edge of the Snake River Canyon uh, until eventually you get, you cross the Snake River and get into present day Oregon. And you cross over the Blue Mountains. You're in the northeastern corner of the state of Oregon by this time. And this is uh, probably the first uh, forest that these travelers saw in most of the trip they've been on uh, since they left uh, Missouri. And then reaching the Columbia River, which uh, was a challenge in and of itself. Uh, coming down through the gorge, or as the, these wagon travelers may be doing, going up around the south flank of Mount Hood on the Barlow Road, an alternate route instead of going through the Columbia River Gorge on the north side of Mount Hood. But that was also a very, very rugged trip to make it to the end point, the official end of the Oregon Trail. Oregon City, just south of present-day Portland. So why an alternate route to that main original Oregon Trail? One obvious reason was the difficulties of the final leg of the Oregon Trail. Um, the Columbia River, uh, before the uh, Barlow Road, People would raft down portions of it. They would uh, take the wheels off their wagons, tie them onto rafts, and uh, make their way down the Columbia River to try and make better time. And there were lots of places along the river where wagons could not travel. Unfortunately, a lot of those wagons capsized, people drowned. It was very, very dangerous. And then going on the Barlow Road was also very, very rugged. 1845, a fur trapper named Stephen Meek, trying to find an alternate route somewhat to the south, got his wagon trains totally lost in the Oregon high desert. Uh, a lot of people died. Uh, and some people were actually talking about uh, uh, lynching poor Stephen Meek. He was not a very good guy. And then the other issue with the Oregon Trail was relative to international boundaries. The Oregon country, all the way from present-day California-Oregon border up to the northern border of British Columbia, was up for grabs between Great Britain and the United States. Uh, we both claimed it, both countries claimed it, and there was uh, thoughts that we might go to war over the question of where that boundary would be drawn. We did not go to war, and in 1846, the year the trail was being laid out, uh, there was a treaty between Great Britain and the United States that drew the boundary at the 49th parallel up here. Okay, so um, the Hudson's Bay Company had uh, established a number of posts, forts actually, along uh, what was had by then become the Oregon Trail, that because of the potential for war prior to the treaty in 1846, it was feared that uh, if we went to war, those Hudson's Bay Company forts could, you know, there could be outright conflict between Americans and British along the trail, and they would control that section of the Oregon Trail. So again, we want an alternate route. And that happened in 1846, a year that some historians call the year of decision, when President James K. Polk, through the Mexican War and the Oregon Treaty, created a, a, a expand of the United States from the Atlantic seaboard all the way to the Pacific. The Applegate Trail's period of use from 1846 through 
the late 1850s. <clears throat> but its heaviest use uh, came in that first year, 1846, and then again in the mid 1850s when a lot of the people using it then were coming to settle specifically in the Rogue Valley, as opposed to the first ones using it in the 1840s who were on their way to the Willamette Valley. It, there were just, uh, the Rogue Valley until the early 1850s was uh, not settleable by whites. It was still a uh, pretty wild country. And let's talk about the road locators. <clears throat> the two best known are Jesse and Lindsay Applegate. And Lindsay is uh, on your right there. Jesse, uh, very famous Oregon pioneer. Uh, and he is the guy who gets the credit and the blame for the Applegate Trail. Because that first year, there were a lot of problems with it, which we'll get into in a little bit. Lindsay actually later settled in Ashland. He had control of a toll road over Siskiyou Pass. Uh, and uh, he and his wife, Elizabeth, are buried in the Ashland Cemetery next to Safeway there. The other primary locator was a Levi Scott, not a very good photo of him, but Mount Scott in Crater Lake National Park is named for him, and he established a little town on the lower Umpqua River called Scottsburg that later was swept away by a big flood. So um, there were a total of 15 or so road locators, all of them settlers from the Labatt Valley. So what route did it follow? Let's follow those road locators south and then east as they uh, laid out the trail. They went from Rick Rial in the Willamette Valley, which is near Monmouth, uh, north of Corvallis. Uh, they went southward through the Umpqua drainage and into the Bear Creek, Rogue Bear Creek drainage, and then up uh, into the Immigrant Creek area and on eastward over the Green Springs and uh, along the California-Oregon border of today, Thule Lake, Goose Lake, and so forth, and, and then headed down into northeastern California over the Warner Mountains and to the um, Black Rock Desert. And eventually they were uh, almost uh, dying at that point when the Vance Party finally found the Humboldt River. And they, they were able to get water. And they straggled along on their way to Fort Hall, one of those Hudson's Bay Company posts. And uh, uh, only a few of them in the lead, including Jesse, Jesse Applegate, made it to Fort Hall, meeting immigrants who were coming on the main Oregon Trail from back east and said, no, don't go that way. We've got a better route for you uh, to follow. And we've just uh, blazed it out, and we're going to go back and make it even better for wagons. So come on this way. And he convinced a lot of people uh, to do that. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Jesse Applegate assumed that the trail, that his locators that he ended up then leaving behind him as he sped back to the Willamette Valley, would do as he had uh, told the immigrants they would do. Uh, improve the route, make it wagon uh, ready. But they did not do that. They just beat a, uh, many of them beat their way back to the Willamette Valley themselves. So these people were facing uh, a new barely blazed route, the, the people on the first 1846 wagon trains. So leaving the main Oregon Trail near Fort Hall, that's the Hudson's Bay Company Fort, getting to the Humboldt River, which led them across northern Nevada. Pretty much the, stay, uh, the uh, route of Interstate 80 of today, for much of the way. They're going through the homeland of the northern Paiute and Shoshone peoples. Uh, and there was a lot of mutual contempt and ongoing, if sporadic, violence. There was theft of livestock, the oxen. They were eaten by uh, the native folks. Uh, 
And uh, if you were a straggler with wagon train, you might be picked off. Or if you were a Paiute who suddenly showed up close to a wagon train, you might be picked off. It was, it was not a happy stretch in terms of uh, interrelationships of the different ethnic groups. Leaving the Humboldt River, water became scarce, and what water uh, springs and outlets there were tend to be highly alkaline, which made it uh, rough for both people and livestock to uh, drink. And now the real agony began, crossing the forbidding uh, Black Rock Desert, this huge playa, ancient uh, lake bed <clears throat> with geysers and hot springs, including hot springs where one of the children on the first wagon train through uh, fell in and was scalded to death. And from there, uh, this area today at Black Rock Desert, as many of you do know, maybe you've even been to the Burning Man Festival, it's pretty odd to uh, picture the, the wagon travelers uh, in, contra, in contrast to what happens at Burning Man, which is not happening this year, of course, due to COVID. On through High Rock Canyon, very challenging, narrow. You can do it in a four by four now if you know what you're doing. Over the Warner Mountains in northeasternmost California and down into the Goose Lake Basin. They went over Fandango Pass, and once they got down in the Goose Lake Basin, they could go south to California or keep going east uh, to get to Oregon and eventually turn north to the Willamette Valley. That's an aerial photo. There's the Warner Mountains, and there's Goose Lake, and they came over the Warners about in here and headed like that to uh, our area. Got to Thule Lake, right on the present Oregon-California border in the Klamath Basin. This area here on, on the shores of Thule Lake became known as Bloody Point because there were a number of attacks by the Modoc and the Pitt River people on wagon trains there. 1853, it is said that on the trail between Goose Lake and the Rogue Valley, uh, over 80 immigrants were killed. I, don't, I can't vouch for that. Uh, that is what the anecdotal information says. And for these people, uh, the Cascades, the Southern Cascades, after having crossed the Klamath River and going up into the mountains, this was the, their first view of forests for many, many a mile and many a day. It was big yellow belly pines, nice grass. Stop at Tub Springs like these folks are doing back in the early 1930s to uh, get a lot of cold mountain water and then down into the Rogue River Valley or Bear Creek Valley. Here's Immigrant Lake Reservoir, there's Mount Ashland coming down along this way down in here to get to the Bear Creek Valley, to the Rogue River passing Table Rock and then came the worst by far the worst was the infamous canyon along Canyon Creek. The uh, Canyon Creek area is now almost unrecognizable from the Applegate Trail days or even from uh, the early Pacific Highway days because it's all been heavily modified by Interstate 5 through there. But uh, the original wagon travel had to go down through this extremely narrow, steep-walled canyon that's just wide enough for the creek itself. So it was full of boulders and so forth. Uh, here it is again down in here. This was towards the very last of the trek. You're out of supplies. Your oxen are dying. You are starving to death. It's beginning to snow on you. Um, and in the, especially that very first trip of 1846, it took a terrible toll on, on the folks using this Applegate Trail cutoff. So how'd they do it? <clears throat> well, mostly they walked. Uh, the oxen pulled, not generally horses, but oxen pulled the wagons, and most people uh, walked with the wagons. So who were some of the uh, people that came over 
that first year, uh, let's start out with, and what they have to say about their experience. Well, one of them in 1846 was this gentleman, J. Quinn Thornton, who was, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a tenderfoot <laughs> from back east and uh, found the so-called trail that Jesse Applegate had laid out was terrible. It was not what he had assumed it would be based on uh, Applegate's description. And he proceeded to spend a number of years, once he made it to the Willamette Valley, uh, accusing Applegate of uh, basically uh, incompetence and even malicious intent. Uh, and he wrote uh, documents about that and uh, so on and so forth in newspapers, J. Quinn Thornton. So here is what he wrote when he uh, was coming down the Green Springs, down into the Immigrant Creek area, down one of the wagon slides. There were a number of wagon slides coming down from the top of the Cascades into the Bear Creek Valley, where you'd unhitch the teams, you tie ropes around the wagons and let them down by rope wrapped around a tree slowly, ever so slowly down very, very steep slopes. Well, he wrote, uh, we had not proceeded more than a mile when it was evident that the wreck of my team, meaning uh, his oxen just couldn't do it anymore, could no longer take forward my wagon. And a companion on the, in the train took his blankets and bison robes and a lot of supplies into his wagon on the condition that Thornton would unite the remainder of his team with this fellow's team because the oxen had been given out all along the way. <clears throat> I was under these circumstances compelled to leave my wagon and its contents in the forest <clears throat> with a great probability of it being robbed and burnt by the savages before morning. We had not proceeded above half a mile when Duke, one of his oxen, when Duke sank down upon the road and with a faint and mournful low plaintive call said, well, my master, I have toiled for you a long time, but, I, but nature I can no longer endure and I must now lay me down and die. I lingered over the poor fellow for a few moments and his fidelity, his willingness to labor, and the important services he had rendered me passed before my mind. Another fellow in that first wagon train of 1846 was Virgil Pringle, who settled in the Willamette Valley. And it was a big family group, the Pringles, and it included his mother-in-law, Tabitha Moffat Brown. <clears throat> and she wrote later in her recollections uh, in late 1846, when they were in the Canyon Creek, uh, uh, disastrous portion of the canyon, of Canyon Creek, she said, we lost nearly all our cattle past the Umpqua Mountains. I rode through in three days at the risk of my life on horseback, having lost my wagon and all that I had but the horse I was on. Our families were the first that started through the canyon so that we got through the mud and rocks and boulders much better than those that followed. Out of hundreds of wagons, only one came through without breaking. The canyon was strewn with dead cattle, broken wagons, <clears throat> clothing, and everything but provisions, of which latter we were nearly all destitute. Some people were in the canyon two or three weeks before they could get through. Some died without any warning from fatigue and starvation. Others ate the flesh of the cattle that had been lying dead by the wayside. Later, 1853, come people on the Applegate Trail who came specifically to settle in the Rogue River Valley, especially in the Bear Creek Valley, which by now had enough whites in it to be somewhat uh, settleable <coughs> by immigrants. And among them was John Beeson's family, including his then young teenage son, Wellborn Beeson there. Uh, that's an adult photo, Wellborn Beeson. The Beeson settled in the Wagner Creek Valley talent area. 
and another was uh, Orson Stearns, who also settled in the Wagner Creek Valley. So the Applegate Trail in our area is well known, uh, fairly well marked and commemorated, and a lot of people know about it. And if you feel called upon to actually see places at, or even walk on places the Applegate Trail in our area, that's what I'm going to end this uh, PowerPoint with is some places where you, you can go and kind of imagine this experience that you're seeing in these images here. So these three photos are taken in a place probably familiar to most of you. Going up Highway 66, you finally get up to the top, and there's a parking area on the right with the trailhead getting onto the Pacific Crest Trail. It's just out of view, right there. That's actually the, the road grade, the bed of Highway 66, heading east towards Pinehurst and Lincoln. And right through here is actually one of the traces of the Applegate Trail coming up out of the, the King Creek drainage. And it crosses the PCT right here. So uh, this is, I think, one of the only places in, in Oregon where a National Historic Trail crosses a National Scenic Trail. So that's kind of cool. And this is looking from this, this photo, looking turning around, looking down towards Keene Creek, that's down in here. On Highway 66, you go around Keene Creek Reservoir, small reservoir, and the uh, Applegate Trail came down this slope via a wagon slide, very steep slope, down to Keene Creek, and then crossed the creek right where the present day dam that forms Keene Creek Reservoir is today, and then came right up the slope. And there are multiple traces of it here because by this time it might have been getting nice and wet. You have muddy uh, ruts. And so what do you do like you do on a muddy, wet section of hiking trail? You get off to the side and you create another trail uh, with erosion over the years. But that's what happened here. Uh, there's several little, three uh, probably, little traces of the trail. Here's a section that has a tree growing through it. And if you look here, looking back up towards the PCT trailhead that's right there, you can get the sense right here of the ruts, a little bit of terrain modification where the wagons went. And then, uh, then that uh, turned down, went down uh, what's now Tyler Creek Road. So when you're driving up Highway 66, just before you get to the Summit Ranch, just before, on the right, there's a turnoff to the right, and it says Tyler Creek Road. Well, you can take that and follow it uh, for some distance, and eventually Tyler Creek Road goes along this ridge crest that's between Tyler Creek over here and Schoolhouse uh, Gulch over here, which both lead down to Immigrant Creek above Immigrant Lake. And so there is the Tyler Creek Road, and in some places, the Tyler Creek Road is right over and has obliterated the original trail. Other places, you can actually uh, just, you know, walk a, a few feet off the current road and find and walk along existing visible stretches of the Applegate Trail. Uh, you can keep your eyes peeled for this yellow railroad steel marker that's on the right side as you're going up. Tyler Creek Road is going to be on the left side, of course, going down. That's a good marker place uh, to stop, and then you can walk this little stretch. And then just a little ways on up the hill uh, are these stretches here. And then you get down to Immigrant Creek and the present Buckhorn Road that many of you have been on. Here's Immigrant Creek flowing just this side of Buckhorn Road on its way towards uh, Immigrant Lake. We're headed north, basically, northwest to Immigrant Lake. This is, was the Applegate Trail. Here's almost where Buckhorn meets uh, Highway 66, which is just right up here beyond this trees. Of the Applegate Trail across this pasture. There's still some barely visible uh, 
sections of road along there. And of course that's Buckhorn Road again. And then you come down onto Highway 66, the Applegate Trail, just as Highway 66 does today, crossed over Songer Gap and over into the Hill Creek drainage, Hill Creek arm of Immigrant Lake Reservoir, and went down into what's now water. And this is on the road that goes up to uh, Immigrant Lake uh, County Park where the Rogue Rowing Club has its boathouse off to the left there, that's their dock. And I'm standing on the top of the so-called Neal Creek Dyke. Looks like a dam, it kind of is, but a big rock dyke. And if you look this way, you're looking towards where the Applegate Trail was coming from, coming around the far side of Songer Butte here, over Songer Gap, down into the Hill Creek arm of Immigrant Lake of today, and then crossing right up and beneath what's now the Neal Creek Dyke, and off through this pasture. Uh, there's another yellow railroad steel marker there where it hits uh, Highway 66. And from that point, along Highway 66, you are on the Applegate Trail. Here's the Oak Knoll Golf Course. Here's the Giles Wells House, built in the 1850s, that fronted right on uh, what had started out as the Applegate Trail, and by, by now is becoming uh, this portion of it, the main trail between uh, Oregon and California, eventually becoming stage route. And then you go a little bit farther in 66, 66 swings off this way uh, and crosses the freeway, and here's East Main Street. Main Street is the Applegate Trail, this stretch of the Main Street from 66 on towards town. Uh, and it may have been in various places a little bit over off yonder towards Bear Creek, but by and large, this long stretch of East Main Street is uh, the Applegate Trail. And then you get to where the railroad crosses East Main Street. And at that point, uh, East Main Street of today is, it's still old, but it was developed when Ashland was first becoming an actual community, and they decided, well, we want to get travelers right down to our little plaza down there on Ashland Creek. And so that developed in the 1850s and 60s to, to the plaza, whereas the original Applegate Trail would have come off this way, paralleling the railroad for some long distance and through the present day railroad addition, eventually making its way north of town and uh, on to the Willamette Valley. So with that, I am done with my presentation and I think I will stop sharing this and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be all together here pretty soon. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was absolutely wonderful. And how much fun to know that the roads that we drive on every day are part of this historic uh, trail system. I learned something new today. Um, so I'm going to take just a few moments to share with you about why the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy is even offering a talk about these trails. Um, and as I'm uh, sharing that information, please feel free to put questions either in the Q&A box or in the chat box. And um, once I've given my little spiel, uh, then we will open up the floor um, and Teresa and I will be passing those questions along to our two speakers. Um, so here we have, there it is. Um, here's a map of the PCT where it runs through our neck of the woods. Uh, the red line, the squiggly red line is the PCT. Um, Ashland is up in the uh, upper left center um, and Route 5 runs north-south right through the middle of this map. Um, the three stars on this map represent the three properties where the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy holds a conservation easement. And between those three properties, we protect about two miles of trail. Um, all of those properties are within the colstein siskiyou Summit Focus Area which is an area that we are really um, excited about uh, conservation in that particular area because it has incredibly high biodiversity, 
where the two mountain ranges meet. And along where the PCT connects um, those two ranges, it's kind of like a land bridge um, where wildlife can cross um, and where there's just incredible biodiversity because of the underlying uh, geologic um, and soil differences in those two ranges. Uh, so we are super excited to hold those conservation easements and to keep those sections of trail um, protected. It helps with the view shed. Uh, we also get in there and do monitoring visits to keep track of invasive species. Um, if you happen to be on the trail and you know and can recognize yellow star thistle or scotch broom, feel free to just pull those right out, leave them, leave them on the trail. Those are some of our constant challenges. Um, but again, those three easements are one of the ways that we help protect these beautiful public access trails. So with that, I can see we've got some questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, we will uh, start asking some of these questions of our panelists. So let's see. Um, where is the best section with local access to the PCT? And kind of a follow-up question uh, is that someone says, following a guide, we could not find the markers at the PCT crossing and along Tyler Creek Road. Um, so can you, maybe William, can you give, give some suggestions for uh, how to get onto the PCT and how to find it around here? Yeah, I, I love that question because we're so close to the PCT here, if you're in the Rogue Valley, um, and somebody asked, what's the, my favorite spot to hike around here? I think the easiest spot to get to, in my opinion, and with the most bang for the buck, is up at Pilot Rock. Um, so if you're going up 99 uh, on your way to Siskiyou Summit, you guys all know that. that there, you pass the Mount Ashland turnoff, and then on your left, you'll see a sign for the monument, our wonderful Cascade Siskiyou National Monument, which we're so lucky to have. Um, you turn left into that area and follow that road all the way to till you get to a parking lot. Um, and that's the Pilot Rock parking lot. So it's a dirt road. It's a little, uh, you know, it's a little wily. But what I like about it too is that you can look over on the left and see the SOLC uh, uh, land that Tara was just talking about. So it's kind of, I love being able to bridge these two areas, uh, land conservation and recreation. And so highly recommend the Pilot Rock Spur. It has some incredible views. You might even get inspired and try to hike up closer to Pilot Rock, which is a little off the PCT. But and then the other section, I just wanted to segue from uh, from Jeff's suggestion. I really like the Bear Creek Valley idea, where the PCT intersects with the Applegate, and that's uh, Bear Creek Valley uh, off of 66. Uh, I think he he made that pretty clear where that spot is. But I would uh, I would recommend those two spots. And uh, the one question, as I heard it, uh, seemed to say they didn't see a, I think they meant a uh, Applegate trail marker up there where the PCT uh, crosses Highway 66, that trailhead there right next to Highway 66. There is, there isn't one of those yellow uh, railroad steel trail markers there. Um, that there's just what you can see with a little bit of imagination and discernment of the trail right virtually as soon as you start walking on the PCT south uh, you just look down to your left and you will see what those photos were, were showing you and as far as Tyler Creek Road it might be best to drive up Green Springs Highway and turn right onto Tyler Creek Road Go down slowly. Once you're on that ridge top between Tyler Creek, it's like kind of a broad ridge top. It's not sharp. Uh, once you're on that and heading down, just go slow and keep looking off to the left, especially when there's little gaps in the road cut immediately to your left. And you should be able to pick out that yellow railroad steel uh, marker. Okay. Hey y'all, there's a question in the chat box um, from Alan Hart MacArthur. Um, I've heard the lower portion of the trail along Tyler Creek Road described as Strychnine Hill. 
Do you know <laughs> anything of this description? Would that be you, Jeff? I, I guess familiar? so. You know, I've heard that a long time ago, but I do not know uh, where that came from. I really, uh, I can't tell you the origin of, of that. Uh, it couldn't have been thing. good. It, it <laughs> yeah. could not have been good. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's, uh, you know, kind of like one of those Rattlesnake Mountain and Strychnine Hill, you know, <laughs> be aware. Uh, but I'm not aware of any, you know, we do have arsenic springs in our area uh, that you don't want to drink a whole lot of, but I, I'm sure not aware of, of any naturally occurring strychnine. I don't even know if there is such a thing. <laughs> any more questions? Yeah, we've got a few more coming in. Um, we've got a request for a recommendation uh, for seeing the Lewis and Clark Trail. William, you probably have one, huh? Yeah, so it's a little bit north, obviously, from us. And um, to be honest, I, I didn't check out the Lewis and Clark Trail Association's advice on visiting. I know Portland's kind of, Multnomah County's had some problems with uh, you know, the epidemic and all that, but, but if you can, get out to the coast and go to Port Clatsop, which is just west of Astoria, Oregon. And it's honestly, it's one of the most beautiful places along the whole trail, in my opinion. Um, you get to see where they spent four and a half months, uh, the winter, was it 1805, if I have my, my number right. And uh, yeah, all the guys bunked there and um, they were very grumpy because it was just raining all the time. And they said it was the most rain they had on the whole trip. Uh, so, but it's beautiful. The Park Service runs a great facility there with the visitor center and you can see a reconstructed uh, fort, Fort Clatsop. And uh, it's just, it's highly recommended. I'd say that's numero uno. All right. Awesome, thank you. We are also seeing a couple questions about whether uh, this presentation will be made available later. And the answer is yes. So if you tuned in late or if you want to share this with someone else, we are recording and we will be posting it on our Facebook, our YouTube, and on the Land Conservancy's website. Um, all right, let's see. Do we have any more questions? Uh, we've got a question. Where did the trail cross Blackwell Hill and was Foley Lane part of the route? Um. It, uh, I believe it crossed, uh, there would have been two routes used at different times. I think the Applegate Trail crossed kind of where I-5 does on the uh, south side of Blackwell Hill, as opposed to uh, what's still known as a uh, old military road, which is a stage road, uh, a little bit to the uh, west and and so forth a uh, crossing uh, so I'm, I'm I think they uh, It's been a while since I've looked at that stretch in the literature that I have but uh, it Almost certainly crossed the south side of Blackwell Hill not going down uh, Along the river itself that would have been too gnarly and steep and so forth and then hitting the river again close to the town present town of Gold Hill. But at this point, they were staying on the south side of the river all the way until they got to a fording place uh, near Grants Pass. Um, and uh, then crossed the river and headed north from there. And much of the uh, I-5 north of Grants Pass is overlaying the Applegate Trail. Any others? Any questions still lingering out there? Uh, we will stay online for just a few more minutes if any more. Oh, here's one. Uh, is there a listing of the pioneers who traveled the Applegate Trail? I am not aware of a specific, you know, like census of them all, but there's an Oregon historian by the name of Steve Beckham who compiled uh, a lot of the uh, snippets of the, the diaries and journals and so forth, and later the recollections of people who did travel the, 
the Applegate Trail uh, from 1846 on into the 1850s. And that should be available, I would think, at the, maybe the SOU Hannon Library as a reference work, I would think, or obtainable somewhere. And he gives a heck of a lot of names in there. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a recommendation in the chat box, the Applegate Trail Interpretive Center in Happy Valley with some excellent displays. Uh, can either of you speak to that? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, I think typically it's called Sunny Valley, but Happy Valley is even better. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's right off of I-5, interchange there. The, issue there is often it uh, there's no one there to staff it i found i've stopped a number of times and it's been closed so it might be worth um going to a website somewhere or making a phone call uh and making sure it is open if you're going there specifically for that purpose um, maybe we can just bring you along <laughs> to, <laughs> to interpret for us. Um, and I do want to note that I put both of our speakers' email addresses in the chat box. So if you have any questions um, that come to you later or that are uh, more specific than perhaps you want to share with the entire group, feel free to copy and paste those email addresses out of the chat box and reach out to them. Um, there was one more about um, that the trail didn't actually go through the Applegate Valley. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, it, it got its name from Jesse Applegate, and it's thought by most that the Applegate River and Applegate, hence the Applegate Valley, were actually named either by or for Lindsay Applegate, who made his way through this area two years later in 1848 on his way to the gold fields in California. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that fact. Very interesting. Great. All right. Well, um, I think that's all of our questions. I will pull up one final slide with that contact information again and some ways to connect with us at the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. But thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thank you for giving us a chance at our very first digital meeting. Um, it's been a real pleasure to put this together for you and we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing everyone. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you.